narrated that most marvelous book of Mosiah. We can't waste any more time, spend any more time talking about the setup of the meeting, the protocol and so forth, which is so thoroughly accurate. I was going to bring on a bound book of some, as many as eight articles of mine on that subject of the great assembly, the national assembly and so forth in, in ancient times. And so uh, it's loaded, of course, with, with evidence of all kinds. But the time is far spent. But notice certain things that every ancient people did hold their yearly assembly, held it a new year, and the king, the king presided and so forth. And when you had the new king, it was the new age, and they brought their first fruits and all the rest went together, not only in Israel, but in every other ancient major civilization at least. And uh, notice he brings them together, now we're in the first chapter here. Uh, he, he has to send out the proclamation, that's the hair hour, you see, when you get the proclamation, you must come, you must come, or be banished from the kingdom for three days. Then you have to go on to give the people a name, it's very important on this case, you have a new name, because this name, it says this later on, this day has he, spiri has he, has he spiritually begotten you. See, this is the Genethlia, this is the Natalia, the day of birth, when not only nature is born, but all things are born in you. That's why sometimes it's held in the spring equinox and so forth. I can talk faster than this, I may have to, you see, because we have to cut a uh, cut and be sure you get everything down. I have to cover a lot of ground. No, watch your Book of Mormon very closely here then. And Mosiah 1, he's going to give them a new name, a new identity. See, every time you get a new life, or a new ad advancement, or a new initiation, a new step in initiation, you get a new identity, a new persona. When a person gets born, he, he gets christened. He gets, he's not christened until he joins the church. This is the theory the Christian world, you see, you must be given with us, it used to be always on the eighth day, uh, circumcision and so forth. Uh, you have a new name, and then when you, you get married, you get another new name. If you get, get any office, you also get another new name, and then uh, at your funeral, you get another identity and so forth. They go through the same ritual every time you go into a new, well then, of course, when you reach maturity, this is a, this is a very important thing. The, uh, the rites of initiation that come with uh, in the Christian Church, it's, it's when you, uh, when you're confirmed, uh, around the age of 15, when you, when you, in all primitive, primitive tribes and everything else, when, when a person becomes mature and reaches manhood or womanhood, then there is that right hand, and then they get a new name. They're identified with another group entirely. Uh, boys are no longer with the women and so forth. They not long be, now long belong to a man's fratry, and all these things. These are the, the rites of puberty. So, and each time you get a new name and a new identity and a new appearance and new marks and something else to say and a new title new degree, but this goes along, and they have, uh, just high, and the Lord will deliver, he gives them the usual thing here, and then he shows, he hands over the national treasures to his successor. You always have the national treasures in Japan, for example, this is the sword, the mirror, you know, the book here, it's and the scepter, it's, you will find the national treasure, often the mace and the ball, as it was in Rome, the mace, the ball, or the maquette in Egypt, or, or the mirror and the sword, or the jewel and the gnobus, there are certain three or four I hope you still have it. They call it the Tiponi. They have a very sacred box, a very secret box, the Tiponi, that keeps their most secret things. The records of their wandering, certain, certain very valuable objects, just as in the, uh, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant, were kept not only the rolls, but kept the lulab and uh, the hyssop and various very important things uh, as symbols of the time when they were in the desert and a sample of the manna. All these things, these were national treasures. These were handed over. And so we have their Tiponi here. They have their national treasure. And uh, it included the plates of bla brass, the sword of Laban, and the baller director of the Liahona. And the baller director we don't, uh, isn't working anymore. And uh, that doesn't th that's not the point. It's a national treasure now. But he tells him in the 17th verse, as they were unfaithful, they did not prosper in their journey. It didn't work by magic. It worked by faith. And this still applies to the Book of Mormon today, you see. It's, uh, it's the book, the plates themselves, you see. If you're faithful, you'll prosper on your journey. And if you're not, you'll be smitten with sore afflictions. Uh, I told you the last time about my home teacher, Brother Amosa, a giant uh, Samoan whose father's a chief and just arrived here. Uh, how are things going in the church? They're not so well. People are indifferent. We need another 1966. 1966, there was a great typhoon that hit them, and after that, the people of the church were very active, very faithful. Now it's they slowed down again, as Native people probably do and as we do, and so they need another shake-up. And as he says here, uh, therefore they were smitten with famine and sore afflictions to stir them up in remembrance of their duty. And this is the new king proclaiming, putting out the proclamation, because the old king is, is usually dead before this happens. He's the successor. Now here we come to a great nation holding its national celebration, celebrating their brilliant victories, their long peace, Thanks to King Benjamin, a great upbeat boon, a time of looking back with pride and achievement. Oh, don't fool yourself. Watch what happens here. 
They gather at the temple, we've seen that. They didn't number, they always have a census when they come in. <laughs> because you see, you must be one of the Enkidu, you must register your name. This is in Israel too. You must register your name when you go up to the temple. They didn't bother to do it, there were so many. They might take their time with it. But they bring their firstlings, it was the new year, all right. And notice what keeps them a society great in the fourth verse here of the second chapter. It's having just men and just teachers to be their king and establish peace in the land and filled with love toward God and all men. Now we don't have to do anything about, this is your great society you might say, but you're doing nothing about power and gain, about military might and wealth of the nation. The wealth is no measure of its greatness and the military might isn't either. Um, so the Assyrians and Kinjish Khan would be the greatest cultures of all time. Just men, just peace, love toward all men. So they come to the temple and camp around according to the old custom, as we know from the temple scroll now, discovered in the 1950s, first published in 1976, according to his family. Every family separated from one another as they have to eat with their backs to each other, in fact, and their tents face the door of the temple, and he has a tower erected. That's a, that's a novelty we didn't know about at all until we got Nathan the Babylon. I might as well put some of those things from Nathan down here. That's who he is. Uh, I guess we've got this. Uh, yes. Uh, mark these things down. He was Nathan the Babylonian, Nathan Hababli. That means the Babli, the man of Babel. Not a good eraser. And we talked about the school of Sura, the two schools, that's the seats that are on either side, his two counselors. They were his counselors. They could give the speech instead of him. He invites them by courtesy to do so. They invite each other to do so. And it comes back to the king again. And then he gives a speech. First, he reads the law. He gives the sermon of the day. You see. But then he gives a daris. He doesn't give, it's not a lolikra. He doesn't read it, but Yadros, he, he teaches from it. He lays down the new law, he lays down his policy of his administration, is what he does. So there's the school of Sura, as it is in our book of, and the school of Pumbadetha. 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 Is it Pumbadetha? No, Pumbadetha. Pumbadetha, Pumbadetha. And then, the, the first school, the more important one, was back in, uh, in Palestine, and uh, that was the school of Jamnia. Jamnia. That was the one they established back in 70. Johann ben Zekai established it when they broke with the temple. They didn't like the temple at all. Well, anyway, we've had this now. And then he starts, he starts his speech to them. These are the words. Yeah, they're going to quote his speech to us with the temple people all around and so forth. And the tower. And he began to speak from the tower. And the people that couldn't read it, the words were written and sent forth. We actually have words, uh, circulars, and of the king's speech being circulated by the king of Persia in distant provinces of the empire. And we've uh, copies of that speech from the time of Darius have been picked up. So the king, if he couldn't attend his speech, he would have it copied and circulated in the empire, as we, as we have it here. Well, anyway, verse 9, these are the words. He says, and you notice how it begins. Open your ears that ye may hear. Now this is a silentium, you see. Silentium, silentium. I say, no matter where the culture was, whether it was, they always use the Roman word, whether it was the Byzantine court, and then it went into the Russian court, uh, uh, when the Russians took over, of course, the Byzantine Empire, or the East or West, everywhere, they used this word silentium because everybody had to be absolutely silent and give ear. And of course, in Israel, it's called the Shema. Listen, listen to it, it's called the Shema. So a silentium. Silentium, silentium, not kind of raid and kind of some. I'm perfectly sure this is Pumbadetha. That's word me there. There, that's more like it. I don't know. So notice, open your ears that you may hear and your hearts that you may understand and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded. It's a solemn and awesome occasion. The mysteries of God, there's going to be a dramatization here. There's, go there's going to set forth the basic principles. They're going to be in contact with the other world. This is a very important thing. Uh, that's what they, it's very interesting, what the Romans called mactus. The Egyptians had a word just like it. You are mactus, that's when the, that's when the mundus is open. The orcus mundi. There, just as there is in all Hopi celebrations and so forth, there is in the center of the ring, the, uh, the canistra. There's a hole and that is the sipapu, and that's the hole which opens up to the spirit world. And it's only opened up on this day the Orcus Mundi, only on this day because, and it's the same thing here. You notice what the, what the, the formula is? I said before, chas, 
the fan out. The Lord is in his holy temple. Everybody hush. Now see, that's the thing that's been taken up by the churches. When you're all together, then the Lord enters as the king enters on the tower and everybody has to hush. Now, see, that's the cilantro here. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And we say, hush the fan out. So here they're to hear the mysteries of God. Now, first of all, don't be afraid of me. I'm just a man. See there, it's a spooky event. It's, it's a spooky occasion. Remember, when you leave this great celebration in Israel, according to the law of Moses, everyone must eat the last meal with his sandals on his feet and his staff on his hand and wearing his robe. They're going to be ready for a quick getaway. And before dawn, they must leave the site and must, must not leave no food there. They must have eaten everything. And no one must look back when they leave. See, very important. See, it's the spirits there. You're going to leave. It's a, it's a very holy, a sacred occasion. Something very powerful is happening there, which they say the Romans call mactus. Well, anyway, therefore, now notice he's checking. He says, don't be afraid of me. This is not, not, nothing spooky. I'm just a man, and this is important to know. I'm no more than a man like yourself. And you see, this is the occasion on which the king would assert his divinity. He was a, hailed as, as a god. I'm Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mortals, and despair. That Ozymandias, that name comes from from uh, Weser Matra, which was the name of Senesret III, who's supposed to be the, uh, the same as uh, identical with Sheshank uh, and contemporary with Abraham. That's supposed to be the Pharaoh of Abraham, people accept. Well, these things all run together anyway. I'm just a like a man like yourself, he says. I have been chosen. Notice he has uh, his authority from three sources in verse 11 here. From three sources. I have been chosen by this people, and consecrated by my father, so he has it in patriarchal lines, been consecrated by his father, but he's been chosen first of all. Notice all our kings, including Nephi here, all had to be chosen by the people. Chosen by the people, and that's what the people come for, to acclaim the king. The climax of the meeting everywhere, whether it's in there, see we have the Psalms of David that describe this situation and various, uh, in various, uh, various aspects of it, and it, it culminates with a with an acclamatio, when everyone acclaims, that's why you come up. To acclaim, almost acclaim in a single voice. You say they do it in a single voice, and you see how that's possible? That's because of the chazan. That's because of the preceptor. He waves a flag and says what there's a shout, and then they all shout it together. This is the way they do it everywhere, including in Israel. That's why it may seem funny to you that people reply in one voice, we have seen, we have understood, we accept, and so forth, using exactly the same formula. It's because they've been told what to, and they're being led by a choral leader. They shout together that way. He's very important to have him there. And sometimes the king himself would take that role, as in a Greek play. This people and consecrated by my father and was suffered by the hand of the Lord. That suffered is very good. The same thing is used in, in respect to the Constitution, which I have suffered to be established by the hand of righteous men and so forth. That means to permit it, to go along with it. It doesn't mean to initiate. Uh, we read from the Doctrine and Covenants, 101st section, the 77th verses following and especially the 79th verse. Uh, and he talks about suffering the next, you know. I have been suffered to spend my day, not I've been commanded, I've been allowed, I've been given that privilege. I've been suffered to do it. It may not be God's plan, but he will allow men to do it their way because it's for their own good, of course. Suffered to spend my day in your service up to this time. And notice, no one can come empty-handed into the presence of the king. And as as uh, Nathan the Babylonian says, everyone brings as costly a gift as he can possibly afford. And uh, Benjamin says, none of that. I'm not going to have it. He mentions it. He talks about it. He says, but I'm not that kind of a king. And this is an important thing. There's been an article that came out, come out recently in the Studio Materiale, the it Italian journal uh, of ancient religion, a very good journal. The main theme of the king's speech when he speaks in Israel is to, he, he must formally deny that he is the king. The real king is God. He makes that clear, you see. He says, you've elected me your king, but the real king is God. Well, that's the theme. It's the theme of the king's speech, and sure enough, it's the theme of the king's speech right here in Mosiah's book. So he says, I have not sought gold or silver or any manner of riches of you. You're not supposed to bring up any of that for me at all. That's not what I'm after. Neither have I suffered that you should be confined in dungeons. You wouldn't put up with anything like that. Or that you should make slaves one of another. Where does the king get this power? He's going to tell you where he gets his power. He hasn't suffered it. He hasn't from, how has he stopped it? Does he lock them up in jail? Does he make slaves of them? If they do that, does he put them in dungeons? No, he says, I, we don't have dungeons. We don't make slaves here. Well, how do you do it? He said, I do it two ways. Notice in this fourth 
uh, 13th and 14th verses first, by teaching and then by example, he says. I have not suffered any manner of wickedness and have taught you that you should keep the commandments of the Lord in all things. In the 14th verse, and I have set the example. Even I myself has la have labored with mine own hands that you should not be laden with taxes or grievous to, grievous to be born. Notice, uh, to suffer, as I say again, he wouldn't suffer, is to tolerate, to condone. Uh, the countermeasure was this, was teaching an example. And this is how it worked. But, does this mean no taxes at all? Many people love this Book of the Book of Mormon, laden with taxes. It's, uh, this means not grievous taxes, yeah. grievous to be born. He says, as he says a little later on, we pray the Lord not to suffer us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. Of course, that's what we talk about in the Lord's Prayer, beyond what we can bear. But the idea of that to any required contribution of me is painful, that's Scotch. That I hear many Scotch jokes in the family about that. You have to give anything at all. That really hurts, no matter what it is and so forth. But uh, uh, whatever brings me money is good. Whatever takes money away from me is bad. That's the simple rule we're following today. Uh, in our legislation, policy, and everything else. Anything that makes me rich is good. Anything that doesn't make me rich is not good. And it's a very simple rule, and it works beautifully with us. We stick to it like glue. But I haven't taught that you should be laden with taxes grievous to be born. And now he says, dear brethren, I can answer with a clear conscience before God this day. Now, this is an important thing to... To whom is the king answerable? He is not answerable to the people or anyone else. It just is in the temple. He's answerable to no one but God, as if that wasn't enough. But of course, the doctrine of majesty in the ancient world is that the king is answerable to no one. This is with the divine right of kings and so forth. George be king, and that brought on the American Revolution. Or Charles be king, and that brought on the, the revolution of 1688, the glorious revolution in England. Or John be king, and that brought out Runnymede, uh, 16, uh, 12, 65, and uh, no, that was the that was the Parliament of, uh, of uh, what's his name, wasn't it? Uh, but uh, I can answer with a clear conscience today. The idea of majesty, the idea of majesty, majestas, and Cicero discourses on it. The Roman theory of majesty is that the magistrate, the king, the top man, who is a rex, is absolute. Nobody can question him. He can do anything he wants. The king's will is as high as it goes. Now, this has been taught right down into the 20th century, just before World War II. This was absolutely believed and taught throughout Europe in, in the great empires of Russia, Austria, and Germany, that the emperor could do no wrong. He was the one. We don't question him. He had absolute right. And uh, the parliamentar parliamentarianism came in way back in the days of King John uh, and uh, put a check on that. But it's still, it was still the thing, you see. And uh, today we have another source that is answerable to no man. Uh, do any of you read much of Malcolm Forbes? Well, if you have money, you don't have to answer to anybody. That's the whole point of having money. He says, you're your own boss. You don't, nobody can question you. So the worst thing that could happen would be somebody threatened to take any of it from you, on legal or any other means. That can't be legal means, because we have to be free, as, as Cain says. Now I am free, his property falls into my hands. That's what makes Cain free. This is a very important speech. You must pay attention to it. So he answers to, a, who, to whom do you make your covenants? Temple or anywhere else? With God and with God alone. You don't make to, we don't make swear oaths to each other. Even when you get married, remember, your covenant, both of the man and woman, is with, with God directly. And nobody else. All who are present, as Hebrews C. Kimball said, all the others are present only as witnesses. That's the whole thing. So if you break them, that's why you're not going to be punished. Nobody's going to send out a posse and run you down because you have broken your, uh, your covenants or promises. No, that's between you and the Lord entirely. It's understood. It's made that way in the first place. And that's the only one you'll have to answer to. You don't have to answer to them. You, they don't know your condition. I don't know yours. You don't know mine. So now he goes on here. And here we have God as the employer and the paymaster here. So he goes to this next verse 16. I've spent my days in your service. I don't desire to boast. I've been only in the service of God. Again, you see, I haven't been serving you. I've been serving God, actually. But I serve God because if you ask him what he wants done, that's the way he wants you to serve him. Yes. That's the employer and the paymaster. But how does he want you to serve him? I mean, what can, as, as they said at the dedication of the temple, remember, as Solomon said, uh, uh, what kind of a house can we build you? The heaven is your throne and the earth is your footstool. What kind of a house, temple can we build you? I mean, well, we can't at all, of course. It's for our benefit that the work is done. And, and here, God wants you to serve him. I heard a good one yesterday. There are a lot of Latter-day Saints which are eager, who are eager to serve God 
on an advisor on an advisory basis. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> and that's as far as it goes. But then he goes on. He, then he says that applies to you too. Notice the seventeenth verse. That applies to you too. I tell you these things that you may learn wisdom. That you may learn that when you're in the service, if you want to serve God, this is how. When you're in the service of your fellow man, you're only in the service of your God. Now, this is how God wants us to serve him then. And uh, it's so easy to use the word God and so forth. Like the, the Victual Brethren in the 12th and 13th century in the Baltic, there was a, they were a pious band of old holy pirates. They were pirates and they had a great castle called the Olmsberg and they robbed everyone. But their slogan was that justified everything they did was Gottes Freund alle Menschen Feinde, friends of God, enemies to all men. Now, how can you be friends of God and enemies to... Well, you can use the word God so easily and say, <coughs> du svelte, God wills it, I, and I chop your head off, and so forth. And in the name of God, we can appeal, both sides appeal in a war to God to justify their case, and so forth and so on. You can't do that. And here, if you want to serve God, that's the way you serve him. He wants you to do that. There's nothing you can do for him. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your assistance. He doesn't need you to rush into the field and avenge his honor, as uh, as we get from from the Middle Ages, from Abelard and uh, and the uh, well Thomas Aquinas, for that matter. God's honor has been damaged, and you must avenge it. And so we go out and chop people up and so forth to say, to do honor to God. And uh, and know again here, you ought. You see, you have called me your king. If I have called me your king, this is the way I serve. I labor to serve you as your king, not to expand my power or my might. Then how not you to, a not ye to labor to serve one another? So it can't be me first. I want it all and I want it now. You labor to serve one another. He's rubbing it in here. Now he says, behold, you call me your king, spent the days in your service. Well... How ought you to thank your heavenly king? He's the real king. This is the point, you see. This is the theme of the king's address from the tower. I mean, we know this from the other cases, too. I say unto you, my brethren, if you should render all thanks and praise, next verse, and if he should serve him who has created you from beginning from the end of all day, if you served him 24 hours a day, day and night, for no other purpose, you would still be an unprofitable servant. You would still, an unprofitable servant is somebody who consumes more than he produces. And you can't possibly produce what you consume. You can't produce a blade of grass as far as that goes. Uh, no one can pay your, his own way in this world. If you say you've paid your own way, you can't. He says if you're 25 five hours a day as far as that goes, even support you from one moment to another, I say if you should serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. That's so much for being independent. You're dependent on him every minute. You should know that. That's why you should realize that other people are too. And what he wants you to do is to help them. He doesn't need your help. And all he requires of you is to keep his commandments. And he has promised you that he would keep them. He would prosper in the land. And he never doth vary from that which he has said. Therefore, if you do keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. Now, in the first place, he mentions three points here. Notice this is one of the constants, this thing. It isn't just the law of the promised land. It, it applies everywhere. And here he goes now. And in the first place, he's created you. He's created you and given your lives for which you're indebted to him. You have no control over that, whatever. The idea of life and death. And then to uh, make somebody worth of you, because if you don't, he'll threaten his life. I mean, he'll die, he'll starve if he doesn't work on those terms. And they did. Brigham Young tells about his first mission. It's terrifying. It's horrifying. What he, went. he said people were dropping dead in the streets. They just couldn't find work because it had been a bad winter, and nobody would give them anything to eat, and they would actually drop dead in the streets and in Liverpool, Manchester, and places like that. And the, the poverty was simply terrible, and nobody would lift a finger. And at the same time, the the uh, nobility and the upper class were rolling in wealth. They were never brought it in, so the, the wealth of the empire started pouring in there. He didn't think that was right. Uh, but he's created you and all that, and why should you deny anyone uh, the right even to live unless he works on particular, on certain terms? If he's forced, you see, he has no other choice just to keep body and soul together to take a minimum, which barely does it. You've got him. You've got him where you want him now, you see, and you take advantage of his necessity to stay alive. Well, the second one, he does command you. He does require that he has commanded you 
for what you do. Let me see. Secondly, he doth require that ye should do as he has commanded you. First, he's created you should be grateful to him. Therefore, in view of that, you should do anything he tells you to do because you are his creatures. And thirdly, when, if you do that, he blesses you immediately. You don't have to wait around sometime later on to see if it happens. This is a very interesting thing. You say, we've waited and waited and nothing has happened. I've prayed, like the woman, the old woman who prayed that the hill would be removed from behind her house. It was a nuisance. She got up in the morning, it wasn't moved. She said, well, I knew it wouldn't be moved anyway. So that's the kind of faith you have. But <coughs> really, <coughs> if you do it, you immediately get results, you see. Uh, no waiting. So much, so much more on being independent. And you are still indebted unto him. And are and will be forever and ever. Therefore, of what have ye to boast, he says. Remember, this is a, a glory. everybody was happy and bursting with uh, fun and they were feasting and all this sort of thing. And now he really starts uh, pouring cold water on it. He's the wet blanket here. We ask now, when he asks, now I ask, can you say out of yourselves? I answer, nay. Well, you cannot say that you even as much as the dust of the earth. You are created of the dust of the earth. Behold, it belongeth to him who created you. Now, where is the hype here? Where is the national pride? Where is the standing tall? Why does he put them down this way? Uh, this is no way to celebrate. Uh, he tells us. He's being very realistic about this thing. He says, now, don't think that I'm, uh, that I'm putting you down. Next verse, I'm no better than you are. I'm no better than you are. I'm also of the dust. You behold that I am old, a man about to yield up the mortal frame to Mother Earth. Therefore I said unto you, as I serve you, walking with a clear conscience before God, even so at this time, you must serve one another. He says, that's it. I'm saying this now, I'm holding the assembly that I might be found blameless. He had his stewardship, and that's why he's doing it. The same way as Paul does. Remember when he, in the Corinthians there, he says, I thank God I baptized none of you, because he says, all Asia has turned against me. His mission in Asia would seem to have been a failure. And he says, I thank God I baptized none of you. He says, but I am queen, I've done my mission, I performed my, my duty, I did what I was called to do. And then he says, he, he shakes his garment, says, now I'm clear. Their blood is on your garments now, it's not on mine anymore. That I might be found blameless, that your blood should not come on me, when I shall stand to be judged of God of the things whereof he has commanded me concerning you. So I'm doing this, God has commanded me, and notice it's very personal commanded me to do certain things concerning you, and I've done it. And now you have to do certain things, because that's what I've been told to tell you here. The, uh, and then, I want to rid my garments of your blood at this period, when I'm about to go down into the grave, that I might go down in peace, that my immortal spirit may join the choirs above in singing the praise to God. Remember, there's a choir, a choir, a very well-trained choir of distinguished young men singing under the under the platform, and it was covered over, so no one could see it. And, and some of the rights, remember, the, the choir would hear it and cry amen and so forth when the whole thing was done in whispers up on the stand there. And then, uh, for the creation hymn, they're there, they're very important. And I've caused that you should assemble to tell me that I can no longer be your king. We're, we're to transmit the, uh, the rule of the kingdom now. That's the purpose of the meeting. And this day, my son Mosiah is a king and ruler over you. So he officially, not until he is acclaimed, he has to receive the acclamation, he'll be acclaimed. See, the acclamatio is very important. If you fail to raise your voice, if you fail to acclaim the king, then you haven't supported him, then you're in a state of rebellion. See, all the earth is either agapacatus or agarhosticus, is either pacified earth, according to the Romans, or it is hostile. And if you haven't sworn allegiance to the emperor, then you're a le legitimate bait for us. We can go out and conquer you because you're in a state of rebellion against the king who has the right to uh, the pater mundi. He's the, the, the parent of the earth, of all the world. You see, he's, uh, that's the title of the Roman Empire. He's pater mundi, and he has a right to rule the earth. And if anybody is not, does not acknowledge his rule, then he's rebelled against him. So the Roman army goes out and conquers it. And so you have this everlasting imperial expansion, which, of course, reached its limits and then collapsed like a bubble, the, uh, as these things do. So. Uh, He's going to hand it over to his son, Mosiah. <coughs> and he's following the commandments of his father. Notice it's being handed down by, in the patriarchal order now, commandments of my father, and have prospered, and have been kept from falling into the hands of your enemies. Even so, you shall keep commandments of my son. His father was a, another Mosiah, see, and then he's Benjamin, and then another Mosiah. Or the commandments of God, which shall delivered by him, you listen to his commandments, I'm handing over the authority to him now, you see. 
and you shall prosper in the land, and your enemies shall have no power over you. Keep the commandments of God given him by you. Now, again, you see, if you don't do it, no amount of armaments is going to save you, as you were, in, as we learned in First Nephi, the second chapter of First Nephi there. And here the real danger in the second, the 32nd verse here. All my people, beware lest there shall arise contentions among you, and ye list to obey the evil spirit which was spoken of by my father Mosiah. And for if he listeth to obey him and remaineth and dieth in his sins, he receiveth for his wages an everlasting punishment, having transgressed the law of God, contrary to his own knowledge. That's the important point. He did it quite deliberately and, and quite openly here. This is what your hellfire is. And then back to this theme again of your obligations. Don't think you're independent. The 34th verse down there. Ye are eternally indebted to your heavenly Father to render to him, not to anybody, to render to him. You do what he wants you to do. That's all that's required of him. But he's told you what he wants you to do. All you have been taught and all that you have and are, and also have been taught concerning the records. And then he thinks these records are very important again. Uh, the obligation to keep conference reports and so forth. You know, the church keeps, has always kept the best records in the world. Uh, and when uh, Herbert Bolton from Berkeley, he was in charge of the, the, all the American history and stuff there. I remember, Bolton was the big wheel there. Uh, he stood in front of the church, the collection of the church records in the historian's office in, in Salt Lake. And he was aghast. He says, these are the only perfect records in the world. Everything was in there, every meeting, everybody who attended at a meeting and everything else. You think it's all useless, I probably, probably is useless as far as that goes, but the record is complete. We insist on keeping a complete record, and as we're told quite often, well, occasionally by writers in the Book of Mormon, I don't know exactly why, Mosiah says it, Nephi says it, I don't know exactly why. Remember Nephi says, maybe it's to preserve the language of our fathers, but it didn't preserve the language. <coughs> they, uh, but we have to keep these records. You don't know what they'll be useful for at some future day. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, my daughter just got back from China after spending one week in Peking. Imagine flying over to Peking, spending one week, and then coming back here. It was on an assignment. She and her husband they had this, this thing funded by Harvard, plenty of dough and so forth. And so they went over for one week, and then they came back. But the interesting thing they discovered is the very interesting uh, attitude uh, toward the gospel there. Certain records of the church, certain things, especially the Book of Abraham and the Egyptian matters, have absolutely fired the people's imagination. She says it will just explode once these things get there. The records we never thought would have any particular value have never had any great appeal to us. I mean, I've taught this book of Moses year after year. Nobody pays any attention to it. And all that Egyptian stuff, we just put it on covers of candy boxes, and we argue about it, and we guess about things. That's not it at all. It's going to mean an awful lot to those people. It may convert half the world, for all we know. But why did we keep those records? Why did Joseph hand them down? That's, that's quite a story, but the records we keep today can sometimes be extremely important. I remember uh, there was a big, in, in uh, was it in 19, yes, early, but not 1909. Oh, there was a terrific rumpus in Washington as uh, against admitting uh, Reed Smoot to the Senate, because he came from Utah and was a Mormon, and of course this was a state within a state and so forth. And after he was in the Senate, of course, they made, then made him another rumpus, they, they framed him. They did also with a couple of women in the hotel room and all this sort of thing. And so the, the great day came and he says, everybody in the Senate knows that I keep a journal and I write everything down in that journal. I can tell you where I was and what I was doing and the whole thing collapsed right then and there, you see. There was no case because he had kept a record of what he'd been doing, where he was and everywhere he was during the time of the day. And you do that, so you never know. Keep a record, especially if you're horsing around. You better keep a record. But don't keep double books. Don't do double bookkeeping, as most of the big corporations used to. Used to, I say. Uh, well, uh, and notice he says, all you keep a record of all that has been spoken by our fathers until now, even no matter how repetitious it is and so forth, that's very important. Keep the traditions, and behold, they spake as was commanded them of the Lord. They f therefore, they are just and true. Here's your tradition again. I've got to write this down because this is something that's come up. Uh, now I say unto you, if you should transgress and go contrary to that which is spoken, you will withdraw yourself from the Spirit of the Lord, and it may have no place in you to guide you in wisdom's path that you may be blessed and prosperous. See, the Spirit of the Lord, it guides you. It won't promise you instant prosperity. It will guide you and give you a sense of the things you should be doing. And if you don't, you're in a state of open rebellion, therefore, 
he, he listeth to obey the evil spirit. Therefore, if that man repenteth not and remaineth and dieth an enemy to God, he demand the demands of divine justice. Notice he shifts this whole thing to the larger scale. This is, this is in the, on the cosmic pattern. This has to do with the other world. That's where atonement takes place. That's where we, we return to the Heavenly Father. That's where we are redeemed, bought back again. See all of that rebusiness? You're redeemed, you're resurrected, you're raised up again. You return, you go back. Yeah, the, the yeshiva means uh, yeshiva means to return. Yeshiva means to sit back, once, sit down once you get there. The reconciliation we mentioned that reconcil. It all has to do with going back to a primitive, to a prior condition that you lived in before you came here. It's very clear. As I say, the only, the only alternative to that is uh, is predestination, a simplistic predestination, which just stops everything dead cold. Well, here we are, awaken his immortal soul to a lively sense of his own guilt and cause him to shrink from the presence. Now, this is what hell is, of course. And to fill his breast with guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire whose flame ascendeth to heaven forever. Uh, in this life, we have a very lively sense of other people's guilt. We don't have a very lively sense of our own, do we? But when you get there, because you'll be the only one who knows about it, <coughs> I say they won't have to bring forth too many books to tell you what you've been up to. You'll know everything. Remember everything vividly, it says. And then what this is, see, you've missed your chance. I mean, things you'll have, you have, no matter how many chances you have hereafter, for example, if you, if you flunked out of school at an earlier time, you may be given other chances, and that's fine, but that will always set you back. You will always regret it. You will always be disadvantaged by it. And this, so, therefore, his final doom is this never-ending. These are terms we must accept if we want eternity, but you'll have to face that, the never-ending torment of the fact of what he had the great chance here and he muffed it, he spoiled it himself, he, he willfully lost it. And so that will never cease to bother him. That doesn't mean that he will always cook in the fire, things like that at all, but don't, don't lose it yet. This is the, the greatest chance, you, may be the greatest chance you ever had. I pray that you would awake to a remembrance of the awful situation of those who have fallen into transgression. How high the stakes are here, and it's an awful situation. I have to remind you of that, he says, because we're always falling into it, of course. And he says, I would that you should consider the blessed and happy state. He wants them to be blessed and happy. After all, uh, that's the whole thing. See, this is not, we're talking about fear and trembling, but that's not the object of our being here, that we should have joy here and now. Uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't, remember, as, as Eve says to Adam in the book of Moses that you should be blessed and happy and when you're keeping the commandments of God. They are blessed, those who keep the commandments are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. So if you want prosperity, that's what you do. You keep the commandments of God. And uh, we are capable of happiness. The word joy appears 167 times in the Book of Mormon. This, uh, with the computer, so you can check up on anything like that and have an authoritative statement. <laughs> we have to quantify everything now, don't we? <laughs> the, uh, the quantification of the obvious. Uh, you'll be blessed in all things, and you, what you're doing is making for a state of never-ending happiness. Now, isn't that asking for a lot? If, you're, if, you're, if the chances are getting that, what a fool you would be to miss it, you see. The, the punishment is not too severe. The punishment is in missing this, being blessed and happy here in things temporal and spiritual, and then a state of never acting. Uh, ending happiness after this. See, the idea of, of Christmas is to give us a, a glimpse, you see, to give us a glimpse of what the world was or the, what the world could be. You see, a Christmas Carol, that uh, Scrooge gets the look, but the point is that it should be Christmas every day. The, the purpose of the Great Assembly, the purpose of the, of the meeting of the Jews at the, on the Yom Kippur to celebrate these things and the, and the festival of the booths and so forth, it's to remind them of their, he's going to bring out that theme of equality here, of a time when all men lived as they should, when, when earth was a paradise, when earth was a Zion. And that's the way it should be. And uh, we can rehearse it once a year just to show that it can be done. See, just one day of the year, we show that it can be done. Then it smacked us, then the, the bonds are let down, then anybody, uh, the Roman formula is, Licentia reverentium amicit. All your formalities, all your stiffness, all your class consciousness must be thrown aside now. This is a Saturnalia. You say, yo Saturnalia, and then we're all equal, we're all brothers, and they feast, everybody gets enough to eat and so forth. That's what we try to do at Christmas. We allow the poor one good meal a day, and we think we feel very virtuous because of that. One day they get proper nourishment. <coughs> but the rest of the time they can take care of themselves. But it's supposed to rehearse what the eternal order of things every day. <coughs> and so, 
He says here that they're uh, a state of ever nothing happiness and uh, well, we get the same thing here. We have to, in fact, we have to fight it down. The feeling that this, that's the right way and what we're doing is the wrong way. We have to fight down the other one, you know, the, the intimations of immortality here, that there is this better life. So many, so many poems and things about it. And the, the one that's most recited in the church is Wordsworth, of course. The uh, earth lies about us in our infancy and so forth. The growing walls begin to close around the growing boy that's still here. At length, the grown man sees it fade away, uh, die away and fade into the light of common day. And common day is the real life. But it isn't after all. It isn't the real life. Come here trailing clouds of glory and so forth. And this is the nostalgia we all feel. That's the basic of Platonic idealism and everything else, is that the, this is not the real world. You all know Plato's story of the cave at the end of the Republic. This world is just shadows on the wall of a cave. And the real light is behind us. We're not facing it. But that's the world we came from. And what we see here is just shadows moving on a wall. Not real substance, not real things. It isn't real after all. When you talk about a never-ending state of happiness, it should be never-ending and so forth, but we don't have this idea of eternal progression or never-ending happiness. That's been wiped out by the concept of the career, which is a very dirty one. That is the idea of the slippery slide. You climb the ladder in your career, and then you reach the top, and then whoosh, down you come. That's the only way you have to go. And uh, everybody knows that. It's a terrible disillusionment, and uh, if nothing else, you die and so forth. No, careerism is as near as we get to it. You feel justified, exhilarated, fulfilled, as long as you're getting promotion. But when you don't get promotion, oh, the bitterness in the army. I heard General Bradley say he never knew a happy general because everyone wants to be promoted over the other, and the promotions get fewer and fewer, and the, the uh, oh, there are 5,000 generals. Uh, and the competition becomes fiercer and fiercer, and the feud among their wives and all the rest becomes unbearable. So he says he never knew a happy general. Well because they want more promotions. So here we go, and Benjamin goes on here. Now concerning that which is to come. Now remember, the purpose of the year festival was to celebrate, was to determine the fortunes of the new age. Remember, it was just not just launching a new year. Here is gar, uh, and yule, the word yule, is the same word as wheel. It means a turning, a revolution. Same word as while, wheel, while. And the interesting thing in the Arabic world is howl. Howla, howla means the cycle turned, the wheel revolved, the year went around. Howl, howla. The Greeks call it the eniautos, the here we are again. And Jane Harrison wrote a book about that. The here we are again, the eniautos. You come back again, and you're in the revolving circle of the time that goes on forever and ever. You, you, you prophesy, and the king has to prophesy. Uh, in Asia, he would use the barisma. That is the 52 uh, slips or cards with uh, signs on them in which he would, uh, uh, which he would uh, practice divination as fortune tellers do with 52 cards. Or the king at Babylon would mount to the top chamber of the tower the, and he would spend the night there and there was a round table and he would cast the dice on it. With uh, 360 possibilities, 36 possibilities in the dice, he would cast them 10 times on a special table and each day would be predicted by that. You see, you could predict it by casting the dice. Or uh, in Germany, of course, he would pour, he would pour lead into water and watch the way it formed and so forth. But all, it's the time of fortune telling, and uh, and that sort of thing. And the, uh, in Rome, you'd have the aspersionis, you'd throw things out and watch how they fill and so forth. Just like you had the divination arrow, you see, the the Lajon was a divination arrow, but you would toss arrows, the tossing of arrows. It's they, still done by the Arabs, the Jews. It's uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, remember, there is the the twelve uh, the twelve uh, arrows of the tribes were, were shivet, they were the shivet, and they were kept in a, in a container, and they would draw out the lots for the tribes. The, the shivet is an, is an arrow shaft, the shivet is an arrow, and that's the word for tribe. And each tribe would have its shaft, which is marked, just as there was marking on the arrows of the Liahona, and you would predict by drawing lots. And so everywhere they, uh, they predict, and of course, by observing the sun in, in the Egyptian, they had very elaborate ways of, of telling it. You have to face toward the south and so forth, and then the haruspices. Uh, from the flight of birds and livers and all the rest of it. But the thing was, it was the time for fortune telling. And he says, I'm going to tell you some things concerning that which is to come. This is the assembly, this is your future, and it's the king's obligation to prophesy on that occasion. But in this case, he's going to tell them what an angel told him, made known by an angel of God. And he said to me, Awake, and I awoke, and behold, he stood before me. And he said, Awake, hear the words I shall tell thee. Behold, I am come to a clarity. Now, this is very interesting, this glad tidings of great joy. It's repeated again. In, in Alma the same way. Of course, that comes from Luke 2 and 8. There were certain, this is the season for that, there were certain shepherds in the field watching their flocks, and the, uh, oh dear, and the, yes, and the, uh, 
the angel of God came and he says, Behold, I have come, fear not, for become, behold, I have come to give you glad tidings of great joy. Now, this is an, an oriental form, and it, it reads in Greek, it's been strained, and in English, even more strained. But it's the masdar is what it is. When you want to make something ext extremely emphatic, the masdar is you repeat the verbal noun. For example, you can't say, you can't say in Arabic, it's not right to say, he rejoiced greatly. You have to say, Faraha farahan kabiran. He rejoiced a great rejoicing or a, a great gladness. And so we have that formula, joy and gladness. Uh, or just you have fear and trembling, you see. You always intensify. That's biblical parallelism. I remember Professor, Professor Popper wrote a, his dissertation on that subject of biblical parallelism. You emphasize it by repeating the same things in another word. In another word, there should be joy and gladness, fear and trembling, uh, light, truth, things like that. They are the same thing. And you put them here. And this formula, uh, tidings of great joy, uh, glad tidings of great joy, say uh, joy and gladness, and uh, other such combinations. But, but they use it as, as intensives. And I say it's, it's a required form in the language the, the shepherds would have been speaking, uh, but it sounds funny in Greek as all, and uh, it's not lifted. I mean, it's not, it's, this is the proper form as it should be expressed. This is the way it is in the Bible, and this is the express it is. The angel uses this on more than one occasion. See, it's always an angel that says this. Uh, awake, glad tidings of great joy. And he scares, the angel scares the day, daylights out of everyone he appears to because it's a culture shock. He comes from the, this other world and it's more than they can take. So the first thing he says is don't be afraid. He even has to say that to Mary. And of course, uh, Zechariah was struck dumb. He was absolutely paralyzed after his session with the angel. Nobody had seen an angel for 400 years. It came as a shock. But here the angel comes to him with the usual formula. The angels, uh, they're not quoting the scriptures here, he's just stating the formula, and they're speaking the same language here that they spoke in Israel, I dare say. And so I see the time is up now, and uh, then the, what he did, this is the Christmas message here, notice this, this is the birth of Christ is exactly what he is prophesying, predicting here. The Lord has heard thy prayers, and the people that you may be filled with joy. The time is not far distant. The Lord omnipotent shall come down from heaven among the children of men. So this is a Christmas celebration here. This is very opposite to the time, isn't it? And he shall dwell in a tabernacle, go forth among working mighty miracles, and he caused the dead and to walk on the, the blind uh, to receive their sight and so forth. And lo, he shall suffer temptation and pain of body and hunger and thirst and fatigue even more than man can suffer. And then there's one more thing here to note here. Why he suffers so much anguish, that blood shall come forth from every pore. I say that used to be considered one of the serious breaks in the Book of Mormon. Ah, Joseph Smith really slipped up there. No, but the poor is an ancient Latin word. It's used by the doctors. Of course, uh, uh, Galen and Hippocrates knew all about pores. They didn't know about circulation of the blood. The answer was, well, nobody knew about circulation of the blood until Harvey in the 17th century. Well, but here they did know that people could sweat and even sweat blood, too, if you can read. And they used the word pores. It's, an, it's the old Latin word for it. It comes forth at every pore. But why? Not because of the crown of thorns or the nails, However pain or the, or the whipping, however bad that may, that has nothing to do with it. Wouldn't even feel them. Remember, mental anguish is far worse than any physical anguish. Notice, because of the wickedness and abominations of his people, that's what causes the suffering. Of course, this is what causes. We read in in Third Nephi 19. So we'll have to take up here the next time and uh, finish his speech. So again, you can see the theme of fear and trembling goes goes through here. Uh, runs like a red thread through this discourse too.